Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. How that must feel like. Honestly, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I, I did my first one of those in 2013. And that's when I really started to kind of get curious about that specific event. And um, yeah. my first attempt, I, I didn't, I don't think I even went in knowing what the world record was. I knew what the American record was. So that was kind of my target. Right. Uh, but I was with, I think I was about 19 minutes short of the world record on that first attempt. So it's been about almost six years just kind of chipping away at it a little bit. But uh, mm -hmm. the Pettit Center ended up offering up a good opportunity, and thankfully I was able to take advantage of it. Yeah, Rafi, yeah. that's pretty you – know, like I said, Rafi, welcome. You look uh, bon bonsoir or bonjour. I don't know what – I guess it's bonsoir <laughs> yeah, where you it's, are uh, right now. Yeah, it's 8, 8 p.m. here. Well, actually, you're in Portugal, so, I mean, I don't yeah. even know how you say good – how do you say – how do you say buenas – I don't know. How do you say – what do you say in Portuguese? <laughs> how do you say it? Uh, I think you say – uh, boa tarde. Boa tarde. Boa tarde. Okay. Yeah. Boa tarde. Anyway, I, I can barely do English, so that's that's a problem <laughs> for me. But yeah, we're just chatting. You know, as you know, Zach, I saw coming yeah. on Zach. You've got the beard, so you're looking you're looking more dangerous. You're looking more <laughs> you're looking more maybe respectable. And Zach's got his his speed cut. He's got his haircut, and we talked about him right. breaking that 100 mile <laughs> world record. You know, yeah. that's the thing. And, and and Zach will have to do a show when we get all the, all your stats and we can break it down. But he was telling me that he was basically because there were so many, it was such a crowded track. He was like constantly having to go around people. And so oh, really? even though he broke the world record by what was it over nine minutes, I think, uh, wasn't it something like nine? It was like Oleg's record was like 11, 28, and you went 11, 19 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was probably the biggest difference in terms of just the actual course itself. When you look at kind of Oleg's world record, uh, and uh, there was another guy in that same event that was like maybe a minute behind him. And then the previous world record before those guys broke it, the, when those two guys went after it, it was actually because it had been, it had stood for 25 years by a guy named Don Ritchie uh, um, from Scotland. Okay. And uh, they're like, someone's got to break this. So they put up a, a prize person, you know, a few guys went there and took a swing at it. And um, Oleg ran 11. So, so basically those guys, when those, their attempts was more designed for that specific thing, just a hundred milers. Whereas nowadays uh, in North America, anyway, kind of flatter ultras haven't been quite as popular as some like type of mountain and trail type stuff. So it's just not very easy to find events that are designed specifically for that. So I usually end up jumping into a, a more popular version of it, which is the 24 hour where people are just trying to see how far they can get in 24 hours. And then I kind of just use a portion of that, but, you know, someone running 24 hours is going to have to pace himself quite a bit differently. So that just puts me in a position to have to go around in lane two sometimes. And this is, it was a smaller track in terms of number of lanes. There's only three of them. And I think they were a little smaller in width than a typical outdoor track. So it's hard to get it exactly compared to another one. But um, I do know, like, especially during the bulk of the day, I spent a lot of time kind of in lane two and then probably equal parts in lane one and lane three on some of those turns. Uh, so that's, that was probably the only variable that wasn't perfect though. Uh, you know, they keep it at, it was normally keep it at like 55 degrees. I think it was maybe a pinch warmer cause they didn't have the speed skating rink uh, iced over. They were renovating it at the time. So I think it was maybe more like 58 or 60, but either way, that's like, that's like ideal. So uh, that made up for, for a lot of probably the, the extra effort going around people. But um, it, I, I kind of like the fact that there was at least one little hurdle there because it gives me the motivation to find, try to limit that, Nate, that one and lower the time even more. <laughs> yeah, you said you yeah. said maybe, maybe even 10 minutes, 10 minutes of passing people. So mm -hmm. you got to knock that down another, you know, got it under sub, sub 11, 10 or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. And I think there's guys in the sport right now that could go well under 11 hours. Uh, so to get a group of guys all kind of targeting a low 11 hour, just under that. You know, ultimately a few will blow up, but one person will have a great day and then we can kind of get a better idea of, you know, how fast can you really run a hundred miles and, 
I think there's starting to be more interest in it now, uh, especially after, uh, after this weekend. I think people will get a little more curious about, about doing it too. And then there'll be younger guys coming into the sport for the first time too that haven't done a ton of stuff and maybe aren't as drawn to the trails as some of the, the traditional guys and gals and, and be interested and come in with maybe like some like 215 marathon speed or something like that. And well, I mean, you got to be fair to yourself because you've got the world record for the trail run too. So, I mean, you got the 100 mile yeah. world record trail, although that was a little bit of a flatter, flatter trail than, than many of them are in this hilly, but still. So, I mean, you can't sell yourself short on that. Well, anyway, Zach, man, that's awesome. Well, Rafi, let's get to why you're on the show. <laughs> yeah, I could talk about this all day, by the way. No, this I could too, but I mean, like I said, we got you here. We brought you all the way in from Portugal. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's good to talk about. So, so Rafi, give uh, people, and obviously I, you know, I've met you and had dinner with you and have been yeah. communicating with you, and I've been on your podcast, and so I've known you for a couple of years now. Um, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, and then we can kind of talk in whatever, wherever we go. Yeah, uh, well, it's a pleasure to be on with you guys. Uh, congrats again to, to Zach for his world record. And, and you had a recent record as well, Sean, didn't you? Uh, you had a, a rowing record, is that right? Uh, no, I, ro- I, won the world, I won the world championships in the rowing. So I won, my, I won the 50 plus 500 meter world championship record. They, they were nice enough to have it in California, which is easy for me to travel to. And I just kind of said, oh, hell, I'll just, you know, I already knew I could win the world championships. And I was just down the, down the street. So I said, I'd just do it. And I, and I won very easily. And I, I was, I was un. For me, I was a little disappointed with my time because I slipped off the seat on the first couple seconds, so it kind of uh-huh. put me back. But I, but I honestly think I could have won the whole thing outright and beat some of the Olympians that were there at the time. And, you know, my my time was like a, within like a tenth of a second from one of the best Olympians that ever raced in a rowing machine. And then and then the top guy was a six foot ten guy from uh, Anton Bondarenko. He's a U- giant Ukrainian current Olympian. He beat me like t- by two seconds, and and I think I probably could have beaten him if I wouldn't have fallen off the seat. So. Anyway, not fantastic. Bad That's just, I'm just thinking to myself, I need to beat some kind of record, something just totally ridiculous, just to say yeah, <laughs> I have gotta, a record yeah, as well. At some point when you get old, you just get old enough and outlive everybody, or you, you, you find these <laughs> obscure yeah. things to do, and you can say you broke a record. But it, nonetheless, it still yeah. takes a lot of effort. <laughs> well, so I haven't beaten any records, that we, as we've clearly established, but I do have a little background in, in science and uh, a uh, really big passion for nutrition and metabolism and exercise physiology. So what I do, uh, so my day job is actually neuroscience research. I'm doing a health sciences uh, PhD at the moment in Portugal. So I'm working with uh, rats trying to understand uh, schizophrenia and the metabolic side effects of antipsychotics. And so it's, it's interesting for me, of course, to study what's probably the most complex object in the universe, which is the human, uh, well, the rat brain in this case, but, you know, we, we're trying to understand the human brain as well. Um, however, sort of before my PhD, I did a master's in molecular biology where I was looking at the uh, metabolism of breast cancer cells. So I've always been very interested in, in breast cancer. Uh, cancer more generally, and uh, really trying to understand the metabolic aspects because I find the genetic uh, theory a very unsatisfying. Um, and then just, you know, I, I actually got into my master's and my PhD because of my passion uh, for nutrition and metabolism and understanding how all of that works. And if there's one person I have to blame, it's probably Gary Taubes, as I've had the opportunity to tell him in person. His book, uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories, really set me off onto that path. And I had come from a business background initially, uh, around 2007, I'd started uh, studying a business when I was at university in uh, London. I was about 17 years old, had no idea what I wanted to do, found it extremely boring. Uh, and then just really f- fell back in love with uh, science. I actually started out uh, uh, watching a lot of physics lectures and, uh, prog- and then suddenly, you know, progressed into biology and nutrition and here I am today doing a, a, a PhD in, in neuroscience and you know, have the opportunity to talk to guys like your, yourself who've done some pretty amazing stuff and go to conferences and, and now actually produce an app, which is uh, hopefully going to help people uh, you know, reach their goals, whether that's fat loss or you know, build muscle or lower their blood sugars. You know, we, we'll be the for, first carnivore-friendly app, as I had told you guys before. Uh, we really want to popularize that as a diet choice because we think it's ridiculous that it's fringe. It shouldn't be. It's a part of the normal human diet. So I'm sure we'll talk a lot about that. Yeah, actually, you know, now that, since you brought it up, I kind of do want to touch on just the, the principle of that, first of all, because I think 
one thing is in, one thing I find really interesting when it comes to really specific diets is that when you look at kind of the data historically, there seems to be a very high kind of failure rate when people try to more or less self serve and and I can I can understand why that would be if you have something that you know someone is explaining or doing themselves and the friend sees it like well if it works for them I'm going to try it and they try it and they make a bunch of mistakes and inherently bail on it because they didn't quite do it right and or maybe it just doesn't fit their their personality very well or something like that but then you start to see kind of modern technology come into the fold and you see programs like what Verta has where you're kind of bringing bringing the service and some of those stepping stones to the person with, with web-based apps and things like that. So do you see that kind of being the next frontier of, of healthcare where now we can eliminate some of the hurdles about seeing a doctor for meaningful amounts of time because we can link them up virtually or via an app and people can problem solve on the fly a lot quicker than they would have been able to in the past? Yeah, I think that telemedicine is definitely the future, but it has to be done right. Uh, because if we keep giving the same bad advice via telemedicine, we're just going to compound the existing problem. If we're telling people to focus on calories and to eat their whole grains and to eat uh, seed oils, then we're just going to supercharge the problem that we already have. If um, we do something uh, different, like what Dr. Tro Kalayan is doing, or Brian Lenskis, or what the guys at Verda are doing, and they're actually advising people to, you know, avoid the, the, the crappy kind of food, which is like flour and sugar and seed oils and, you know, not focus on calories, but focus on when you're eating and the frequency of food and, and try to sort of simplify things, which because nutrition is a very complex, multivariate, uh, multivariable uh, problem to solve. You, you absolutely do need some good heuristics to simplify. And I think telemedicine allows doctors and, and not just doctors, but coaches and dietitians to actually catch problems before they become serious. So I think we, you see that in weight loss where people will have a very stressful few weeks and they'll start plateauing. And, you know, we have some physiological explanations for that, like the increase in cortisol and, and all of that. And we can help them. We can catch them early and say, don't worry about it. Just don't focus on how much you're eating or the fact that you're not losing uh, weight. Just focus on, you know, mitigating your stress and then your weight loss will probably resume and we see that that's much more effective yeah and, and that makes a lot of sense I, I see that a little bit even in my own consulting where you know, have someone who's comes into a specific program well-meaning and there's just a couple pieces of the puzzle that haven't quite been able to figure out and uh you know they talk to someone who's been doing it for maybe a little bit longer or who has made that mistake and kind of learned from it they can fast track themselves to getting on the right program as opposed to getting frustrated and giving up. And I'm sure Sean probably sees a little bit of that too with people who reach out to him and are trying to troubleshoot things that come up with them or at least get peace of mind as to like, is this supposed to be happening or is this reason to bail out on what I'm doing and kind of start back over? Yeah, yeah. Rafi, I think that, uh, and this is something actually I'm working on with, with a team that we're, we're looking at doing something similar to what you're alluding to. Uh, obviously my biases towards, you know, a nutrient dense, you know, lack of processed food. Well, you know, pro again, there's arguments about how we define processed food, but I mean, junk food is we, we, we all know kind of what that is. And, you know, trying to develop a support system, because I mean, a lot of it is compliance. I mean, I, I like to look at it as motivation, knowledge, the execution and long term compliance being the components of what's going to make someone successful over the long haul. And ultimately, it's not a diet, it's not a you know, and I think the term way of eating becomes a little cliche and I don't like to use, but I mean, it's just basically, you know, changing a relationship with nutrition in general and figuring out, you know, distancing ourselves from why we eat, most of us eat, which is entertainment, socialization, cultural pressures, boredom, stress relief, you know, the, the myriad of things that we, we eat for that are outside of nourishing ourselves and we have to get away from that. Um, so the question becomes to me, because you say, you know, whole grains and, you know, we, we're all very much uh, aware of the mantra of, you know, whole grain, fruits, vegetables, low fat, lean protein, um, you know, that sort of thing that we've been kind of pounded with for the last, you know, half century, basically. And the thought is that that advice is beyond reproach. We shouldn't question that. You know, I've got a book coming out, Carnivore Diet, and I, and I, and I specifically say in that thing, I think these things aren't tested to the degree that we we allow those assumptions to be made. I think there's a lot of assumptions. And I know we, you've, you've talked about that in my 
my belief is saying, hey, maybe humans are facultative carnivores. You know, maybe maybe we do better on a meat-based diet. How do we know? We've never really tested that, at least not in the, the, the scheme of modern nutrition outside of isolated population groups who, by all accounts, were thriving. Um, you know, and people dismiss that and say, well, it's 1920 science, it's 1890 science. Uh, surely the, the, the scientists back then didn't know what they were talking about. They didn't have the advanced tools we have. They couldn't diagnose diabetes or heart disease or you know, but I mean, at the same time, then you can say, well, what happens when modern people, and this is a nice thing about this carnivore movement is we're getting people that are doing that experiment. Uh, they're, they're, they're being the guinea pigs and, you know, lo and behold, most of them are getting pretty darn healthy, which I think is very much, uh, very interesting. And I, I kind of got, uh, you know, I saw guys like Chris Masterjohn said, it's uninteresting, these modern carnivore people, that's not really interesting data to me. And I, I, I'm just like, are you, I mean, that is the least scientific thing I could possibly think of is to say that here's a group of people that are doing everything quote unquote wrong. And the result is opposite to what we've been told. And you find that to be uninteresting or uncompelling. And I think that's a, that's a major problem with uh, where science is today, particularly nutrition science. Yeah. There, so you raised uh, uh, many good points here. First of all, it's, I think it's objectively interesting if you care about the scientific method, which operates through falsification. So I don't know how you can say it's uninteresting if your goal, if your, if your sincere goal is to actually, you know, put some work toward disproving the assumptions or the established science or your own theory. So it's definitely interesting. It's, it's probably very difficult and very uncomfortable for people who have strongly held beliefs about what a healthy diet should be. Uh, but it's definitely not uninteresting. So I think, I think that's the first thing. Second of all, you mentioned the argument where people will say, oh, this is you know, early uh, 20th century science. So what? Uh, quantum physics was established in the early 20th century. Look what it can do for us nowadays. When the science was done has no bearing on the validity of the science. Uh, modern methods can, can certainly help, but th they can also blind us to some very uh, logical, basic reasoning that... Uh, has happened in the early uh, 20th century when it comes to scientific experiments. I mean, if we just take the Bellevue experiment uh, where the two guys, Stephenson and his buddy were held up in the, in the hospital for a year, that is much more controlled than the epidemiological nonsense we see nowadays, even if it's on two people. That has much more physiological meaning. You know, we can look at their symptoms, you know, we can look at their bloods, we can see over the long term, one year study, that's a, a, a you know, decent amount of time. Um, and I think this brings up to the, to the other point, which is we've forgotten the concept of the burden of proof. I think this is, we're so lost in this sea of nutrition where people do not even think of the claims that they're making in terms of what is the burden of proof here? Because anyone can say anything, but at some point you have to establish, you have, you have to have some sort of guiding framework to say, okay, if I'm going to make a claim about nutrition, you know, uh, is it do I, is the onus on me to sort of come up with data or or what kind of assumptions I can make? And the way I approach this is you have to use the lens of evolutionary biology, and this really puts you know it's a sniff test. It really it can sniff out a lot of the bullshit that that people put forth in nutrition because if it has no um, if it's totally incompatible with uh, ideas in evolutionary biology, you have to at once be even more skeptical than your baseline skepticism as a good scientist. And ultimately, things that are true in science have to fit, or true in biology in this case, have to fit with principles of evolutionary biology. I think this idea has been so uh, misused in, in the field of nutrition. We've forgotten that it's the most powerful idea to come out of biology. We can explain how species evolve, how the fact that we have common ancestors, we understand what evolutionary pressures are, how our environment uh, shapes us, and this is super relevant to nutrition. So is, what is it that came out just uh, yesterday or today that on the front page of uh, basically in the first search results of Google's there's the PETA website saying that we're herbivores. I mean, it, how is that not the Onion article just taking over a PETA? It's, it's absolutely ludicrous. We, we know that humans are at the very least facultative carnivores. And actually, if you look up the most recent study by 
Trinkard's uh, Richards in the National Ac Academy of Sciences who looked at you know, the bulk collagen measures in, in bone and teeth. They were looking at the nitrogen isotopes and they found that the highest levels of, of nitrogen that were measured so far were in humans, you know, beyond even what you see in hypercarnivores actually. And they mentioned in their paper that the most parsimonious explanation of that is that the Neanderthals, the Pleistocene modern humans are carnivores. It's written plain and simple. There are multiple papers backing this. You know, stable isotope ratios of, are based on um, established principles of physics. This is not some food questionnaire. This is not some anecdote. Uh, it's, it's been repeated in sites in Europe, in sites in Asia, and the comparison has been done, done between Neanderthals, Pleistocene modern humans, and the local fauna, so they can have some sort of, you know, control comparison. So, Rafi, I saw people don't a, know this. Yeah, I mean, I, I also saw a study, it came out of South Africa, looking at dental, uh, I think it was enamel, and they were looking at, I think, barium strontium ratios, and they could, they could also calculate diet, you know, based on trophic level, and they saw that even then, and, and you know, the, the, the humans in South Africa, and these are, these are probably, you know, back uh, two million years ago, a million and a half years ago, I believe, uh, where we're looking at even the, the early, you know, what, what came after the Australopithecines. And we're seeing that the Australopithecines had the sort of more uh, uh, generalized diet. And then we see the, you know, the uh, Artipithecus or the Paranthropus, Boisei and, and Robustus, and some of these other variants where they were very much uh, browsers, you know, they're, 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 their signatures look like cattle basically because they could browse on these things. And then they were looking at the, the, the human precursors, the actual, you know, homo genus, and, and those guys were basically indistinguishable from other carnivores. And again, there's more evidence to this thing. Now, the counter argument, and I see some of these folks that are, that are pro-vegan will say, well, there's coprolite evidence, evidence where we find fiber in these coprolites, which are, you know, these fossilized human stools. And then there's some dental scrapings from, from dental calculus where they'll say there's fiber or there's maybe dental wear patterns consistent with, uh, you know, some grains in the diet and stuff like that. But I mean, how do we contrast that evidence versus the collagen dating? I mean, wh how, do we, how do we give weight to those different things? And we had CJ Hunter on here and we talked a little bit about this, but I think it bears repeating or perhaps your sort of take on that. Yeah, so th there are different ways of, assessing the, the diet of you know very very old skeletons so you can look at the enamel of the teeth you can look at the actual you know full structure of the tooth you can look at the bones you can look at the sites of you know was there a fire for example you know around the the cave you can look at chars you can look at the geography to see what the local fauna could even have supported because again you need to look at multiple aspects and multiple things have to fit together you can't just pick one piece of evidence and fixate on that. And when you look at the global picture, the stable isotope ratios being the, the single strongest piece of evidence, you look at when, the, uh, when fire emerged, right? And you look at when uh, that this coincided beautifully with the expansion in our brain growth, right? So the timeline fits with fire. We know that you can look at dental enamel and there are it can tell us some things, you know, it's very interesting to look at, at, at bacteria and that sort of stuff, but it, it's limited in, in what it's going to be able to tell us in terms of dietary composition compared to other techniques. So each technique has a strength and a limitation. If you look at the coprolites, um, no wonder there's some fiber in there. I mean, we're, we're you know, we, we have our hands in dirt and, in, and we work in, you know, in the, in the savanna or in the forest. We know that uh, uh, hunter gatherers you know would consume the the organs and the meat uh, of a fresh kill we know that there are some undigested grasses in the herbivores that that they hunted so is it that surprising that there'd be some fiber or that they you know consumed some some fruit when they were hunting just grabbed a handful not at all in fact it would be it would be super weird if there was zero traces of fiber that does not negate the trophic positioning of humans as uh, carnivores or as facultative carnivores. And I think it's good to have this qualifier. You could say opportunistic carnivores, facultative carnivores. It, it really depends on, on how 
you know, there's some nuance there and that's fine. We can, we can debate those. We're omnivorous facultative carnivores, you know. Yeah. Rafi, can you uh, elaborate on the term? Cause I, and I use that in my book, facultative carnivore is, is my sort of, sort of conclusion in there, but can you talk about what a facultative carnivore is for people that don't, may not understand that term? Yeah, so this is actually a, t a term that I borrowed from Amber O'Hearn. I had been using opportunistic carnivore. Um, I'm, I think I might prefer her term, to be perfectly honest. Um, I think this means that essentially the, the most advantageous dietary pattern that we evolved on is a highly carnivorous diet. And like most things in life, these things aren't absolute. Um, we know we have the liver enzymes to deal with the uh, level of toxins that are in many plants, but we know that there are the vast majority of plants that we cannot consume, otherwise we would be violently sick. So once again, it's about understanding the, the whole picture. And I think facultative is this useful qualifier to really pin down the fact that we're highly carnivorous, but we have this incredible adaptation to eat a wide variety of diets. And it's not just variety between plants and animals, it's also variety between marine and land animals. So I think people have to think a bit further than, than simply this plant versus animal. They have to think humans have spread everywhere around the globe. It's, it's, it's really, it's, you know, to study the diet of a, the human species, it's incredibly complex compared to most species who have this very restricted diet. So it's no wonder that we we're in these debates, but I would just like people to, to sort of accept some very basic facts about our past, our evolution, and never forget that we have to square our modern observations with this data from our past that is really helping us form better questions for future clinical trials and even for drug discovery, for heaven's sake. We learn a lot about our drug discovery just looking at uh, how we evolve to handle toxins or other things. So we should keep this idea at the forefront of our mind. Yeah, one thing, and, and, and I was looking into this a couple of years ago, and I, I was really kind of looking into the, the physiology and the biochemistry of, of other carnivorous animals and to see what was interesting there and what kind of parallels we may draw to humans. And I, and I noticed that in, in, you know, in, in cats, in, for instance, I mean, they have, even though we would all consider those guys, uh, you know, uh, complete carnivores, you know, they are, they are basically obligate carnivores and yet they still maintain the capacity to uh, uh, basically digest 90% of any sugar they may, may consume. They can, can they can, mm -hmm. they can eat diets containing 40 to 6% carbohydrate. I mean, they can do that. And we see that in the modern cat. Now it doesn't mean, uh, you know, and we see what happens to a lot of cats that are fed grains in a grain food cat, and they, they eventually get fat and sick. But I mean, they still maintain some capacity to do that. So the argument is, well, humans have salivary amylase, humans have pancreatic amylase. I mean, you know, it could be there. It was there for digesting glycogen from, uh, you know, uh, uh, fresh kills. I mean, I mean, you can make that argument there. And, and you know, certainly I, I don't dismiss the, the fact that we probably continue to eat some fruit. And, you know, these people that make this humans are frugivore argument, which, I mean, they, 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 they rightly say that we evolved from a, not necessarily a chimp, but a whatever, whatever the common ancestor was, which probably did spend some time in the trees eating fruit. But they, they, then, they, they then skip over six million years of evolution <laughs> to say that right. hey, none of that stuff different. happened. You know, we didn't, we didn't. And, and, you know, the thing I always point out is, look, you've got monkeys and, and chimpanzees who've been in the trees for, you know, you know, seven, eight million years, 25 million years for monkeys and eating fruit and their brain didn't go get any bigger. I mean, they, 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 that was the evolutionary dead end for them. And, and because, you know, three million years ago, we had this huge shift in climate and we got colder. And, the, you know, obviously the, the lush tropical regions gave way to savannas and grasslands. And all of a sudden you either, you know, you either adapted to, to survive or you went extinct. And so that's where we came from. And so it's kind of. I've got a, a quick question for you guys about what you were saying, Sean, there. Like, do we know any, or do we have any info about kind of the difference between the, the essentially the, the, the glycogen that you would obtain from a fresh kill versus, you know, what we're going to get in most of our store-bought meats? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, basically a fresh kill, they're still uh, form glycogen. And then after a period of time, and it may vary, but most people say, you know, within maybe several hours, 
uh, that glycogen will be converted to lactate. And so then it, oh, okay. it's, it's, it's changes. So you can't get, you're not getting glycogen in a steak. Liver arguably will have a little bit still, you know, a little bit more uh, carbohydrate in there. But for the most part, if you're eating steaks from the, from the store, and one of the reasons is remember all, well, in the U.S. anyway, presumably most of Western Europe and most Western countries, they tend to hang the meat for a period of time. And so unless you are a, you know, a Siberian indigenous tribe living off fresh caribou, you're probably not getting a great deal of glycogen in your, uh, you know, in, in the meat you're eating. So that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of there. Yeah. And, uh, and you, uh, Sean, you brought up the um, Amy gene. So it's also known as Amy one. And uh, so this was a few years back. I don't know if you guys remember, there's this big kerfuffle in the paleo community about the copy number. So the number of copies we had of the Amy uh, one gene, which is, which encodes the amylase enzyme to digest starch into sugar so that we can absorb the monosaccharides in our, in our gut. We have to break them down to be able to absorb it. So there's um, a three gene cluster. It's Amy 2B, Amy 2A, and Amy one. And basically, these guys will help us digest starch. And because we have an increased number compared to some, some other species, this was reported to be, you know, a very strong genetic proof that we were, in fact, highly adapted to, to very high carbohydrate diets. And that's probably what we should be eating. And not only that, but Amy1 was reported to be the largest genomic influence on obesity at one point. So this was a very strong claim about the genetics of obesity and, you know, how, and, and the fact that if you had, you know, a high number, you could handle starch well, and that, you know, this was going to reveal to us how we should handle obesity, probably by a high carb diet, of course, was the implication. So there was this really great paper that I paid a lot of attention to that came out in 2015. Uh, they took, uh, it was about, it was under 4,000 individuals, there was lean and obese Estonians, so from Northern Europe. So this was done in two cohorts. And they improved upon the previous genetic techniques to find associations between BMI and Amy1 copy numbers. So with a 99% power to detect what's called the lower bound of effect on BMI, meaning if you're going to find some sort of association, you would find it with a lower bound they found absolutely no association whatsoever in the genome with these thousands of individuals uh, who were either lean or obese, so you could have a good comparison. So it's, it's interesting how, how the idea of genetics and obesity seems to be this very strong argument. And yet when you actually look in practice and in, in people who are actually obese, who are actually lean, and you know, if you're gonna, if there's this causal relationship, you must find an association within the genetics. We don't find it. So I think once again, this would have been totally predictable given our, our highly carnivorous past. But if we forget our evolutionary past, then of course these things seem equally likely. I think this is a, a good example for people to remember that you know, you, you have to use the sniff test at least, or at least the answer of, uh, to ask a better question. I've seen some interesting uh, sort of genetic looking at some of the like uh, South Pacific Islanders. And there's some thought that, and they are ravaged by diabetes, you know, as, as we see them adopting a Western diet, like much like we saw with Inuit, like we saw with American, in, you know, Native Americans with, you know, Tongans, Fijians, Western Samoa, and so on and so forth. As soon as they, I mean, it's almost within a generation, as soon as they're, they're introduced to the high carb flour sugar diet of the West, West, they balloon up like crazy. And some thought was that that was actually a protective, uh, you know, selected for advantage so that they could handle these long sea crossings so that they could eat, you know, maybe they could eat enough starches and and you know fruits and what stuff to put on enough body fat so that they could they could survive these 20 30 day sea crossings that they would have done to originally mm -hmm. colonize the south seas and stuff like that so it's kind of interesting that that yeah. may have had an evolutionary advantage or a selection advantage for for certain populations and now it comes back to bite everybody now that we've got this unending you know this inexhaustible supply of carbohydrates which everybody has access to yeah, so it, that that boat crossing explanation is pretty. It's pretty creative. I have to say that it's. it's uh, I, I like to play around with those evolutionary ideas. I, I honestly don't know how much weight it actually has. But you mentioned obesity being, you know, sort of a, a protective in that case, and I think there's actually a lot to that. I think that 
people who, who quote, manage to get obese tend to actually be uh, pro more, uh, more protected from diabetes to a certain extent. Now, that can seem a bit confusing because, you know, people who are diabetic tend to eventually get fat or people who are fat eventually become diabetic. But I think there's a lot of clinical evidence showing that, you know, people who really can't get fat, like if we look at an extreme case, like people who have lipodystrophy, which is this disease where you'll look at the top body, the top part of a, a person and they're super skinny. And then you look at their, you know, uh, lower part of the body and they're, they look totally obese. So they have this inability to store fat normally. And we see that fat is actually, it's seen as this passive reservoir of energy, but it's actually, it's, it's an organ. It's absolutely an organ system. It buffers our energy. It, it sends inflammatory signals. It, it regulates gluconeogenesis in the liver. You know, how much fat you release from your fat stores goes to the liver, regulates glucose output. That's why our our power hungry brain really relies on our fat stores. We're extremely fatty uh, species compared to most other you know, hominids. So we have this, this really interesting case of, of the uh, island populations. And you know, it's funny because they're, they're said, well, they traditionally eat a, a higher carb diet. And that's, that's true. When they eat their traditional higher carb diet, they're pretty, pretty lean and athletic. And the favorite example is the Catawans. But what they don't do is eat a lot of flour, actually. They eat carbs in their whole form, which are more slowly digesting, whilst the flour increases the rate of sugar absorption in the gut, which dysregulates the incretins and leads to insulin spikes and blood sugar spikes and fat storage and all of that. And the, the Kitavans still eat a fair bit of meat, and they eat a high saturated fat diet. So they're still respecting these evolutionary principles which are totally, totally compatible with what we could call a paleolithic diet, which is definitely mostly low carb, but you do have these interesting outliers, which seem to do pretty well in terms of basic health, but they might not do pretty well in terms of stature, right? So they might have some disadvantage, which still allows them to subsist on their diet. So it's really interesting to look at the outliers and still understand how they're compatible with you know a more traditional highly carnivorous lower carb uh, human species yeah you know i think it was uh dr ted Naiman we had on the show a while back who was uh, talking about his the personal fat threshold idea where you you kind of like what you were saying where you're almost in a worse case if you're what society's kind of term skinny fat because you don't have the ability to create that large buffer which ultimately is probably going to be just as bad eventually if you are able to, because then you're just going to be obese and get type two diabetes, but at least you have a little bit more of a buffer zone before you add that second piece to the puzzle. Yeah. The, the, the idea of the personal fat threshold is really interesting. I, I looked into it quite deeply about a year or two ago. I sort of came to the conclusion that it's, it's probably not that simple but I think there's a lot of merit to it in terms of, of understanding at the very least how you can't, you, you, the, basically, I think of it this way. Your fat has a capacity to expand, right? Like every, any other tissue, it's more or less insulin sensitive. It can take up fuels more or less easily. So if you want the worst sort of diet that's going to make you super, uh, uh, your fat tissue super insulin sensitive, and break down your muscle, eat a low protein diet with a lot of seed oils in it. That's the perfect recipe to become fat and sarcopenic. If you want to do the opposite, eat a high protein diet, very low in seed oils, high in monounsaturated and, and you know, saturated fat. Then eat something that resembles you know, paleo diet or carnivorous diet. And then you're reversing that, that issue. So it, it really has a lot to do with the, the fat tissue's capacity to expand. And I think we see this in obesity where fat tissue is highly inflammatory. Um, so there's a bit of debate back and forth, whether the inflammation is causal, whether it comes later on. It seems that you don't need the fat tissue to be inflamed right at the start, but that down the road, if you pass that, what we could call the personal fat threshold, you're definitely gonna start to create some inflammation, which is gonna have systemic effects, whether that's on your brain or on your liver or on the diabetic phenotype. <laughs> Now for a word from our sponsors. This episode of HBO is brought to you by Juve. Juve uses targeted red light therapy to help assist with the changes to light exposure in our modern environment. 
I've been trying out their desktop model recently and Sean has been using their full body model. I personally love the convenience of the desktop model for when I'm working on coaching plans or editing podcasts and just kind of generally sitting at the computer for long parts of the day. I can just set it and kind of forget it and it'll expose me to that red light therapy. Juve uses a unique Lego block design, so if you start small, you can always add units later to build a bigger model. If you think you might benefit from more red light exposure, check out some of the wide-ranging clinically proven benefits to red light therapy that are focused on things like recovery, sleep, performance, inflammation, etc. If you like what you see, consider Juve's third-party tested Class 2 FDA registered devices. Their options include door or wall mounts, mobile stands, and even a portable Juve Mini. Head over to juve.com forward slash HPO. That's J O O V V dot C O M forward slash HPO to see Sean's training video. Enter HPO at the checkout for a gift with your purchase. Now, back to the show. Hey, Rafi, just back to protein because it's a topic that comes up. And I, you know, like I said, I think we just have to keep working on this issue. Um, talk about protein ceilings. You know, I mean, there's a theoretical protein ceiling of about uh, 35%. Some people will say based on yeah. what evolutionary humans likely ate. There's some talk about urea, you know, re- urea handling capacity, what the liver can convert ammonia to urea. I mean, do you have any knowledge or can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I looked into that for, uh, for a while and it, it's true. You, you get to that by 35% number. Uh, which comes out to about, I think it's about between, you know, 300, 300 something grams a day. If you look at, you know, um, sort of a medium sized individual, maybe around 75 kilos. Um, I don't think that number is correct. I think it's an, it's a, it's, it's sort of back engineered number where they're looking at sort of standardized rates of enzymes that allow us to convert uh, enough urea from uh, the nitrogen we intake so that we don't get uh, ammonia poisoning, basically. So there definitely is a ceiling, but we honestly, we don't know where that is. And it seems to be way higher than we initially thought, which is not surprising given the number of variables that go into uh, how much urea you can dispose of. So there's your level of hydration. Are you exercising like a madman? Because if you're running all day or doing some intense effort, you, you can burn actually quite a bit of protein. I mean, your, your body's not dumb. It can use that up. So I think the, the percentage of your diet, of course, are you hypercaloric? Are you hypocaloric? If you're hypocaloric, that ceiling is going to go probably higher. But if you're super, super, super low calorie, then that ceiling is going to be a problem because you're not getting enough fat and then you'll end up with rabbit starvation. So to, this is all to say that we don't know. But I think if we try to step back for a second and try to get sort of a, okay, I'm in a stable diet, I'm a healthy guy, What's the protein ceiling for me? I would say that you're probably gonna gonna run into problems with your appetite and with your energy levels. And I think that at least in the short term, that should is gonna be a pretty good guide because I think we've all experienced, for whatever reason, whether because someone <laughs> forgot to bring the butter or you just have a lean chicken breast and you just can't stand it, and you're like, I, I need some fat. And and clearly, I think it has effects on taste. It has, you know, effects on your digestion. It has effects on your energy levels. So the protein ceiling might not ultimately be down to the rate of urea disposal. You know, it it could have something to do with IGF-1 levels, maybe. You know, maybe there is some sort of balance where you need to have a certain RQ, so the respiratory quotient, which is determined by how much fat you can burn. And that might be more important in terms of longevity. So maybe there's a short-term ceiling, right? Which is just feeling sick from too much protein and not enough carbs or fat. And then maybe there's a long-term ceiling where you're, maybe it's a lack of the other macronutrients or an excess of the protein, which is leading to uh, you know, high circulating levels of IGF-1, which, which just isn't beneficial. But it's, it's actually a really hard question to answer, and we, we just don't have the data to put a specific number on it, but it's probably more than 35%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think there's, there's pretty good real-world examples of people far exceeding that yeah. and, and not, you know, running into ammonia yeah. toxicity. I mean, it happens all the time. We had Jose Antonio in here talking about guys eating, you know, five 600 grams of protein a day. And, and I mean, personally, I've, I've sat there and eaten five 600 grams of protein a day, and mm-hmm. You know, I'd, I'd have to calculate my exact percentage, but I mean, I, I handle that. I don't have this, you know, I'm not in there getting, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, my uh, ammonia, you know, <laughs> levels, yeah. you know, taking, taking care and taking care of, you know, but um, let's talk about a little bit about longevity because I, this is something that I get a little frustrated with because we have this sort of, and maybe you'll, maybe you'll back me up. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll shoot me down. But I, I, I'm at the point where I, I don't believe we know the answer to what's going to, what's going to, what's going to ultimately give us longevity. I think it's still highly speculative. I think there's, we're getting some pieces, but people tend to make wild extrapolations based on that. We saw that stuff with mTOR signaling and then we find out, wait, well, wait a minute, there's more nuance to this stuff. And so I, you know, this sort of belief that, you know, I, I saw this today and we had Spencer Nadalski on the show the other day and Spencer's a good guy and he's into lifting, but he's like, well, you know, putting on muscle is probably not compatible with longevity and maybe you need to be on a plant-based diet to, uh, to, 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 to have longevity. And I, and I counter and I said, look, I just don't think we know. And I, I don't think, I think those sort of statements are uh, at best premature. And so I think we have to sort of step away from what do you think we can say? Yeah. I mean, outside of, not, you know, becoming an alcoholic and being an IV drug user. I mean, you know, the stupid stuff. But I mean, I don't think we can say eat this macronutrient ratio and you're going to live long. Do you, are we at that point yet or, or do we not know yet? Definitely not. And I, I totally disagree with, with Spencer. The, the advice would, would sort of the default advice would be just eh, compromise your muscle, go to a plant-based diet. I disagree with him. I disagree with Longo. I think it's really misunderstanding the, the tissue specific, specific roles that mTOR have. You don't want mTOR upregulated everywhere all the time. You want it to be pulsatile. You want it to be high in muscle. You want it to be you know, lower in the liver at certain times of the day. Um, this machine is regulated in a beautiful, beautiful way. And we know some very, very simple things that we can start building a better understanding from. For example, if you want to live long, don't be a frail old man or woman. I think that's, that's beyond obvious at this point. Um, look, look at even the, the rodent experiments. I mean, forget humans for a moment. Rodents who are you know, frail and who have insufficient amounts or, or low quality protein, meaning from incomplete protein sources, right? And, and that's a species specific statement because it depends on the species. That is a bad idea. So to tell people to go to a plant-based diet right off the bat makes no sense from what we understand in terms of muscle quality being built, not only with the proper amount of protein, but the certain ratios. So this is something, once again, we, we have this sort of, if we, I'm sorry to always bring it back to evolution, but if we looked at our evolutionary past, once again, it, it's actually giving us really useful clues. Now, it's not simply a question of imitating what we did in the past because that's not necessarily the optimum way to live our life nowadays. But I think that for the protein question, you want to have enough mTOR at certain times of the day that are compatible with circadian biology, right? So you don't want to be eating constantly in the middle of the night because you're, you're going to have a very inefficient processing of that protein. You're going to have mTOR activated at the wrong time. So timing, frequency, total amount, ratios of amino acids. And of course, doing this within a low glucose environment, and most importantly, a low insulin environment. mTOR can be elevated by eating you know, 200 grams of high quality protein from beef in a meal, but you're still in a low insulin environment that's counter-regulated by glucagon. That is something our body is exquisitely good at handling. What it's not good at handling is incomplete sources of protein in a hyperinsulinemic environment from a diet which has rapidly absorbing carbs. And then you see mTOR sort of become this bad guy, but it's, it's just the end, it's sort of the, the, the hand that's pulling the trigger. You know, there's, there's a brain behind the hand, and this brain is the, the proper context of everything else that must happen. So... What do you need to make a human live really long? Um, first of all, actually, it it's, doesn't even have to do with the diet or protein. I mean, if we really take a step back, we know that social support is by far the, or the, the factor that's going to uh, make it such that people live a long life. People who are isolated don't live long and, and it's probably not happy lives either. So we know that stress has a vast, a really important component. We know that, you know, 
being exposed to the sun so you can transform cholesterol into all other sort of precursors is going to have a massive impact in maintaining uh, pushing away anabolic resistance that happens with age and allows you to actually make use of that protein, right? It's actually putting mTOR to good use. So I think that this, this sort of Longo-esque hyper-focus on minimizing protein and, and, you, and selecting poor protein sources, it fails at every level in my mind. And it's really doing a disservice because the research that is being done in rodents on mTOR is actually really important. We're getting even some pretty interesting uh, drugs that are un trying to take advantage of that system and, and hopefully we'll get them. But for sure, if we look at diet, you know, restricting your protein to like 10% for what? Like there's, there's just no good reason for it. <laughs> You know, we had uh, Professor Keith Barr from uh, UC Davis on uh, about a month ago talking similar about the, you know, the differential upregulation and downregulation of mTOR and, and the tissue specificity of it. And I think that's important to realize that, you know, you need it for muscle. You, you, you don't want it maybe in fat tissues or in your liver or something like that. And so there's different, there's more nuance to that sort of stuff. Um, you talk about the difference in protein quality. If I were to put, uh, you know, Dr. Michael Grieger in here, he would tell you that, you know, you can get all the amino acids you want from all the plants have complete amino acids. And so all you got to do is mm -hmm. all you got to do is, you know, just mix, mix the right combination. And, you know, you, and, and many people like Dr. Dr. Garth Davis would say, well, we eat too much protein anyway. You know, we, 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 we can get by with 50 grams, 60 grams a day. Uh, what do you say to that sort of, sort of, you know, argument? Well, um, these guys, honestly, man, like they're propagandists. I'm sorry. Like, I don't, I don't take them seriously. I, I really don't. And I know that, that we have to take their arguments seriously because people ask us questions about it and you know, we have to take the question seriously, but these guys are not honest brokers of information. So I think that should be said at the outset. Um, in terms of what they're saying, in terms of excess protein and quality of protein, um, no, I mean, it's very clear if you're, if you're trying to feed yourself from plant sources alone, you will be deficient. It's a question of when, not of if, and you will also be missing out on all of the other micronutrients that come along with those high quality protein sources. So there are multiple problems to this. For example, you'll be missing out on methionine, uh, which is pretty important. Um, and there are other ones, right? You're going to have, uh, insufficient amounts of leucine you're going to have even if you take the amounts that you could find like on any website and look up the nutrients you're not going to absorb what's there there's this question of bioavailability that's that's often missed and you know it's it's a question of what's in the food how can you access it and is it in the active or inactive version um, so the, this is, this does, it's not even a question just about protein, but it's also about the micronutrients in general. If you don't have the machinery, the enzymatic machinery to actually convert, to make those conversions, the count that you're getting in the food from a website is going to be totally inaccurate. So I think we, we have to, once again, take a step back, see what we've been evolved to handle properly and understand that yes, you can get protein from plants, but it is a lower quality source you are getting an incomplete uh, ratio. The amounts that you see listed in plants are much, much lower than the amounts you see listed in meat. For example, I think it's about 95 to 98% for, for beef, what you can digest and actually absorb, whilst in, in certain legumes or grains, it's gonna be around 70, maybe 75, 80%. You know, that's pretty substantial difference when you add it up over a lifetime. So. You know, if you're an athlete, there's, there's not even a question of what protein you should be aiming for. It should come from plants. And even, honestly, if you're just trying to be a healthy person, definitely aim for, for animal sources. Um, eggs, of course, are, seem to be sent from the heavens above. They're, eggs can't do wrong, basically. I mean, they're, nine, they're the reference point for the digestibility of, of protein. You know, they, they come, come along with tons of other nutrients. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting, this... I don't know where it started. Uh, I think it probably came from the Seventh-day Adventists, um, the, this idea that, you know, plant protein was somehow better, but it, it couldn't be more wrong. And this is a myth that it eventually has to die because it's, 
It's having serious consequences for people. I know someone who, if you look, if you look at him from the outside, he'd look like a perfectly healthy guy. And I've known him for a couple of years, and he's a vegan, and you know, um, telling me how how great life is, and that I should follow his way. And just yesterday, I get uh, a message, and he tells me I have a grade two disc degeneration in uh, at the top of my neck. And it's really sad because it's like seeing a slow motion car crash. You cannot expect discs to main, re remain healthy if you don't have a proper source of protein. You know, I kind of want to jump into the whole bioavailability thing a little bit here too, because I think uh, you touched on it where, you know, you look at those charts and, and the natural common argument to that is just, well, you know, eat twice as much of that and you'll get it or pair these nutrients up and you'll get it. And, you know, my first thought, and this is semi selfish, I guess, just because it's taking into account my lifestyle versus everyone else's perhaps. But, you know, the last thing I want to do is be eating twice as much as I already am. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's like, you know, I'm sometimes eating twice as much as I would to sustain my size when due to activity level. So when someone says, oh, well, yeah, you just got to eat a ton of stuff. It's like, well, I done kind of a more plant heavy keto diet in the past. And, uh, you know, even by even just judging by digestion alone, I knew that wasn't going down the right path for me personally. Um, so I guess kind of my question then too is like, perhaps there's someone who has, would have way more success of it than I would. Uh, is there something to be said about just big ranges from individual to individual in terms of how much of the, how bioavailable say an incomplete protein source would be uh, versus someone who really struggles to digest and almost, would need that meat source or that complete animal source a lot earlier or a lot more frequently? That, that's a really good question. And honestly, I do not know. I couldn't give you specifics, but I think we do have some parallel examples that should sort of set the stage of how we should start thinking about this. So if we look at, for example, uh, let's just take folic acid and methylfolate. We know that folic acid is less bioavailable than methylfolate. And now, if you have you know, a higher gut pH, meaning it's less acidic as it should be, you're not going to be able to absorb folic acid as well as methylfolate. Do we have the same thing with amino acids? My bet is probably, but I couldn't tell you which one and to what degree. I'm, I'm not going to you know, make up a number. But I don't see why amino acids would be spared from the concept of bioavailability. I mean, you know, they can bind... Um, things that are that, that are in food, you know, depending on the charge of those molecules. So there, there definitely is uh, factors that, that affect the bioavailability of proteins. There are probably some genetic differences, which, you know, uh, might allow you to subsist slightly better. But whether these differences are actually meaningful, meaning do they have an actual clinical outcome on disease or on performance, that's going to justify someone saying, oh, yeah, you know, be vegan, that's fine. Uh, I would be very, very surprised. I mean, you know, never say never, but I think the burden of proof would be on people making that argument. And I would look at the evidence, but so far, no one has been able to make it in a convincing manner. And again, what, I mean, there's, I mean, you can't, you can't, on the one hand, be deficient in a handful of micronutrients, yet somehow handle the protein quality like perfectly. It doesn't really make sense from the evolutionary perspective that you could select for, for those things. So um, I think, you know, if you actually ask, I don't know about you guys, but the vegans I've spoken to who, who actually do an actual vegan diet and who, are, who seem to be doing pretty well, they always supplement with some source of protein. And that is basically, they're not actually doing the experiment that they're saying that they're able to do. When carnivores say, you know, I'm, I'm just eating meat and look, I don't have deficiencies. They're actually just eating meat and not having deficiencies. Well, so when a vegan tells me, oh, look, I'm, I'm working out like crazy and look, my vegan diet is supporting it. Well, you know, you're taking whey or you're taking some other sort of hemp protein concentrates, you know, with the leucine spiked into it or something. So maybe, but so far I haven't seen the anecdotes or the clinical data to suggest that people can really, you know, quote, get away with a plant-based uh, protein. But like everything, there's going to be some alleles and some slight genetic di differences that, that, uh, that could affect that. Um, I know, for example, that 
if you look at uh, isotope studies that track the conversion ratios between uh, ALA, so the plant omega-3 version, uh, and, and DHA, so you have uh, ALA in order to be used, to, to be transformed into the usable form of omega-3, which is the active animal version, which gets elongated to DHA and EPA. We have a terrible genetic capacity to do that. I mean, it's between like one to 6% or something like that. So you, you lose like more than 90% of the ALA to get, to get a little bit of omega-3. We know that women have a slightly higher ability to do that with those omega fatty acids. But generally, it's pretty low, and, and the differences aren't, they're not meaningful. They're not going to save your life. They're not going to save you from a condition. They're not going to turn you into a better or worse athlete. Like, you know, we still need the active form, basically. So I don't know if that helps to answer the question for, for protein and amino acids, but I think if we look at everything else, it gives us a few hints. Yeah, no, that, that's helpful. And I do think, you know, when I see just anecdotal, like, claims on YouTube or wherever from some of the, the vegan athletes, you know, especially when you're getting to kind of the strength and power lifting things, it's, it seems to be quite heavy on, on the, the, the protein powders and things like that, which it, I guess that brings up the question then, is that considered a whole food plant-based diet then? Or like if you're taking 10 scoops <laughs> yeah. of protein powder, that's, you know, that seems yeah. like a processed plant-based diet at that point. Or I mean, yeah. processed loosely meaning everything i guess is technically processed to a degree but maybe a, a slightly heavier processed plant-based yeah, diet. It's, it's it's like shooting yourself in the foot and putting bandages on and saying look how good my bandages are they improve my life i'm like, <laughs> like to me it just makes no sense why not go for the quality outright like uh, I, I don't i don't get the i mean i understand why people do it because they think they're doing the healthier thing and they're willing to compromise some aspects of performance for their health but I think it's simply totally misguided. You know, we have people and they'll say, you know, they'll, they'll readily admit, okay, yeah, humans ate meat. You know, that was, the, the, uh, and I think the anthropologic evidence is overwhelming that we did. I mean, there's no, I mean, the people that try to make this humans are herbivores. I mean, that's a completely ridiculous argument, but even though, even the ones that will concede, yeah, humans ate meat, but, but now it's, you know, 2019 and we have technology and we can, we can make the supplements and we, we've got, you know, we've got the, the, the technology to theoretically maybe provide a complete human diet based on what we know so far. Now, there may be some things we don't know yet. I mean, there's, there's probably compounds and ratios and, you know, different upregulation, downregulation things that happen in the human body that we don't even know occur yet. Uh, but, you know, they'll make the argument that, you know, hey, man, we're driving cars, we're flying in planes, we've got cell phones, we didn't have that stuff 50,000 years ago why can't our diet evolve too? I mean, what is uh, what is the counter argument to that sort of uh, uh, yeah. sentiment? That's a, no, that's a, a really good point to bring up because I think it's a well-meaning one actually, but I think it's confusing novelty with mismatch. Um, let's, so let's take the example of dairy. Dairy is a modern addition in terms of evolutionary time span. It's a modern addition to our diet, right? It's about maybe 10, 12,000 years old at the latest, probably a bit uh, younger than that. So we have had some evolutionary adaptation to it, but it's not what's called a complex adaptation. It's not like our digestive system changed anatomy. That would be a, a complex long-term with a lot of selection pressures kind of adaptation. We had what's called a simple adaptation. We had this pre-existing molecular machinery, right? Um, and it basically, all it did was instead of turning off uh, once, you're, once you're done breastfeeding, the adaptation was turn it back on. Now you can digest lactase. It's a simple dietary adaptation. We have not adapted to digest grains. We don't have the capacity that birds do. We can't eat bird food. Grains are bird food. <laughs> We're just not adapted to it. Uh, we are not adapted to quickly absorbing carbs. Our incretin system in our gut, so GIP and GLP-1, the L and the K cells that host them, they are not adapted to the rate of sugar absorption across the gut. They will hyperstimulate insulin. They will keep it elevated abnormally. And this has a whole stream of, a uh, whole host of downstream effects that you guys know as, as well as I do, that that is not a, I mean, it's a normal response to an abnormal stimulus. And I think this is where the confusion lies. There's novel things can be totally uh, 
matched to our physiology, but they have to respect some, some the, their core features have to be compatible with our evolutionary apparatus. Something can be totally novel. I mean, you know, our brains are meant to enjoy novelty. We're, we're, we're adapted to novelty. It's, it's important. We can, we can handle that. We have this complex brain that can handle many novel aspects, but that doesn't mean that, you know, just because something is new, that something is new is better, or that because something is old is better. You know, the fallacy goes both ways. So I think it's really about understanding that our diet can evolve. And I think in principle, at least, it's absolutely possible to invent a, a, a food, you know, within the, the totally new food matrix, and it can be compatible with us. But I think people totally underestimate the, the difficulty in achieving that task su successfully. So far, the food industry, in the vast majority of cases, the novel foods that they've invented are crappy and they are not matched to our physiology. Um, so this is a discussion I had with Fahad of Keto Geek many times. And, you know, I told him, uh, it's fa if you want to try to turn around the food industry so that they can put their technology to regulating our insulin rather than disrupting it and aiding our appetite rather than hijacking it, I'm down. I'll, I'll support you guys, right? I'm, I'm totally happy with that. But let's not pretend it's an easy task. Let's, let's face the complexity of the biology we're, we're confronted with. So, you know, there's what's possible in principle and there's what's possible in actual practice. And so far, to have a healthy diet, you're probably going to aim for ever, like old foods, quote. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, most of the food that's designed these days is, you know, the, the, the main consideration is profit, profitability, shelf life stability and all that stuff. And so, I mean, I think it's, it's an impact on human physiology epigenetic modification and long-term health is, is, is at best an afterthought. I mean, they may give lip service to that stuff, but I mean, I think the point you made about lactase persistency or, and you know, the fact that, you know, we breastfeed and breast milk has lactose in it. I mean, the glucose galactose polymer, and we have that ability and, you know, it's the same lactose that's in, you know, dairy milk or sheep's milk or goat's milk or whatever, whatever animal you want to get it to. So we did have that capacity to do that. Now it's dealing with some of the novel proteins where some people have some of the issues, but it's probably not the lactose. So I wonder, you know, why we see this persistence of lactose or lactase maybe in Scandinavian populations, whereas maybe in Southeast Asian populations, we see less of that lactase persistency i mean what is what is uh, i mean do we have any mm. idea why that's turned on why that's turned off and you know if it can be yeah. turned back on and it, know, yeah an interesting, interesting discussion it de it's definitely interesting last i looked into it i think the estimate i saw was that 70 percent of the people in the world didn't have this this simple adaptation so you know there's a, there's a good third who have it and I think there's a strong geographic uh, correlation to the people who have it. So it tends to be people in colder climates, which, which may have done more, more hurting, generally speaking. Um, it's not entirely clear to me if it's just a question of, of proximity with, with herds. Um, and I think there's actually quite, quite a, a decent amount of people who can digest, who don't have lactose intolerance despite not having the, the genetic adaptation, meaning there's probably some microbial uh, composition that can make up for the fact that you don't actually have that gene turned on able to digest lactose. Yeah, I mean, you would point to like groups like the Maasai population who, you know, yeah. historically, you know, the, even they're, they're African, they're not the traditional northern, you know, herd pot, herders, but I mean, they were the Nilotic Africans that had this. And it's kind of funny now that we're seeing even some of the plant-based advocates saying that dairy is somehow racist because some people don't have lactase. And so therefore eating dairy and, and, and the USDA saying that dairy is part of a healthy diet is, is a racist policy, which I find is just absurd when you could say, Hey, look, there's people of Asian descent, you know, maybe they're Mongolian, other uh, people in Africa that, that, that do have this. And so there's people of all colors that still have lactase uh, capacity. So uh, to make it a blanket racist sort of thing to me is just, you know, it's kind of ridiculous. Well, I mean, you are wearing a red shirt, so that means you're right wing, which means you're racist. I, I think I think we can all stand behind that logic, right? Because that's the level of logic that these arguments support. I mean, man, 
uh, you know, diet is, is it's it's worse than religion sometimes. I think people get get all all sorts of crazy with diet, and yeah, there's nothing racist about a dietary preference. I think. So yeah, well, at least I don't think so either. But hey, Rafi, tell us a little bit about um, you know that you say you're designing an app, and just, just kind of walk us through the what it's supposed to do and where you're at it in the process, so we can kind of maybe ask some questions about that. Yeah, definitely. So the app is basically uh, born out of our frustration from the fact that not a lot of people read nowadays. So however much good content we put out, a lot of people are going to want a practical solution right off the bat. And there's nothing wrong with that, to be honest. I, I totally get the mindset. So we thought, okay, let's turn our knowledge into something more actionable, turn it into a tool. So to do that, we basically developed two apps. One is on mobile. So it's on iOS and Android. It's called Nutrita Lite. And it's a very simple food scanning app where you can you know, look up a food or scan a food label and right away get three scores, which we think are pretty important for, for guiding dietary choices. So basically we have an insulin index to tell you if this food is gonna hyperstimulate your insulin or, or not, if it's gonna be a more of a low level, normal stimulation of insulin. You have a keto score for the people who, are, who wanna follow a keto diet. So it's gonna tell them very simply if this food is gonna allow them to stay in nutritional ketosis. And then we have our, uh, my personal favorite score because it's the, it's, the, it's the one that was much harder to develop actually from the scientific perspective. And that's the nutrient density score. Uh, so we talked a bit about that in, in, in this chat. And I think this is where, you know, we always want people to use this score in combination with one of the indices. We think that whether you're low carb or higher carb or following a insulin lowering diet, your food choices should always be nutrient dense. And if you compare our nutrient density score to most nutrient scoring systems out there, people will quickly realize that we hold animal foods in very high regard. Uh, nutrients aren't just vitamins and minerals, they're also protein, quantity and quality, uh, fatty acids, it's, it's the whole thing, basically. So that's the three scores people can, can check out. It's, it's not just available in the mobile app, it's also available right on our website for free in the food search engine that we have right on our homepage. And then we have the uh, Nutrita Pro, which is a web-based app. And that app is more for some long-term goal achievements. So people who, who might want to you know, put on muscle, lose body fat, control their blood sugars, or just maintain their weight and, and track some basics of their diet. Um, don't come to us if you want a, just a calorie counting app. We don't do that. We don't think that's, a, I mean, it is a physiological variable. We'll report it, but we won't make it a center of focus for any of our health goals because we are not uh, machines that can accurately count calories. So we focus on meal timing, quality, the types of carbs. Uh, you know, you can choose a carnivore style diet. Uh, our protein recommendations are, are much higher than the average. So there, there's a lot of carnivore friendly and paleo friendly concepts within it. You know, one of the concepts, and, and I like the, the, you know, the nutrient, you know, putting an emphasis on the nutrition and the nutrients in food rather than just the, the pure caloric content, because we have this sort of discussion that some of us are involved in, you know, and, and, and you know, probably most of the world doesn't care, doesn't know about this, but the people that are concerned about this are thinking about, you know, how do we feed the world? You know, we've got purportedly, you know, 10 billion people are going to be on the planet in 2050, whether that occurs or not you know, we don't know for sure, but supposedly most likely it will. And we're, we're hyper-focused on calories. And it's like, you know, we can, we can make a bunch of grain and feed enough people by doing that. And I know guys like Don Lehman, who we've had on the show, have kind of run the analysis on, you know, what about the nutrients? What about the essential nutrients? What about things like lysine and zinc and iron and some of these other things that are critical for overall nutrition? And when you put those into the calculations and, and, and you can, you know, you can run, you know, greenhouse gas per calorie, but you could run greenhouse gas per essential nutrients. And you see a much, much different picture appearing. And, and, and then you see the essentiality of animal-based food products in the food system and why it has to be in there for us to have a thriving population. I mean, we can, we can make a, you know, a, a bunch of people that are not healthy. And that, that may be arguably 
good enough for some people. I, I tend to disagree with that, but I do appreciate the fact. And it would be interesting is, is, you know, we get more people that can compare, you know, this food is more nutritious than that. You know, like I said, an ear of corn versus, you know, 100 grams of steak, which one is going to give you the most bang for your buck, either, you know, calorically or just nutritionally. And then, and then you can say, well, what does that do to our environment? What is the environmental cost of that nutrition, not necessarily the calories? I think that's an interesting discussion. And I know you're not a, you're not an agricultural EPA greenhouse gas guy, but I mean, it's, it, I think framing our argument more from a nutrition standpoint or a nutrient dense standpoint makes a lot of sense. And I think it helps clarify things. Yeah. And actually one of the most interesting, I think, I think I said it might be the most interesting podcast I listened to this year was when you had, uh, it was Rob Wolf, right? That you had on that discussion was absolutely fantastic. I learned a, a ton and I don't think we should concede the argument that, you know, we're trading health for sustainability. I think that's totally wrong. I think most of the world's land is, is actually, um, uh, is going to support a lot of ruminant grazing much better than it will monocrop agriculture. I think just from a first principles perspective of thriving ecosystems, we have a mix of species of plants and animals who uh, share the land and with the microbial mass. And these things have to work in symphony. And I think that if we, if, if we want to keep feeding seven, eight, nine, ten billion 10 billion people, we're going to have to feed people high quality food so that they're not sick and going to crumble and economies are going to crumble because of the healthcare. I think when you're trying to solve a problem, you're not going to, to, to solve it by just saying, Oh yeah, 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 we're just going to make all this other stuff worse and then try to make some sort of small change on the side. I think that's totally wrong headed. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, you know, and I'll, using the U S because the problem is when we look at global stats, we have to look, I mean, you really have to look at country specific data to see what impact you will have in your own country and what policies in that particular country. Cause if we look at India, for instance, I mean, most of their greenhouse gases come from cattle. I mean, because they just don't have, you know, the, the electrical, the energy production system, the, the industry system. I mean, it's so, so you could say, well, in India and, and much of the cattle is not being eaten because of, for, for religious reasons, they still, they still eat cattle and they still export some, but most of their herd is what poorly managed. And then you can, you, you, and so, so you see a larger greenhouse gas footprint in that country. And so the question becomes, well, they're already mostly vegetarian anyway, and they've got the second biggest cattle herd, herd in the world. What do you do with those guys? And then you look at the United States where, we know that cattle produce 1.9% of our greenhouse gases. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny amount. We compare that to the energy sector, which is 28%, the transportation sector, something similar to that. And we have to say, you know, what are we actually accomplishing there by, by taking the nutrition out of the diet? And then we know that the healthcare sector is about 10% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So we can say cattle are 1.9%, healthcare is 10%. Do we grow the healthcare sector by making more sick people? And, you know, there's people that would argue that, well, no, 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 everybody's going to eat beans and kale and they're going to get healthier. Well, that's not what's happening. We're seeing, what are we seeing right now? We're seeing Silicon and Valley investing not in kale and bean, uh, you know, organic produce production. They're, they're investing in processed food, processed fake meats. And so we know what's going to happen. And for many people, meat is the only unprocessed food they eat. And so when you take that out of the diet, their diet becomes 100% processed, you know, and so it's just, yeah. it's kind of a, a very, you know, I think, I think you, when we, when we myopically look at one little aspect, we ignore the big picture and that's where we get into big trouble. Well, yeah. another thing too, like, cause you keep take like you, you hit it, you, what I would, part of what I wanted to bring up to Sean was just the regional component of that. Cause I, and I see it a lot where people just, you know, dismiss that or simply say, well, you, you, have, you should reduce meat to save the environment or eating meat is bad for the environment. And they, they look at that as kind of the end point of the discussion. And it's really a, just a classic example of a surface dive because it's like, well, what meat are you talking about? Like, are you talking about something flown in from another country and then I'm eating it? And then is it grass fed, grass finished? Is it, uh, you know, regenerative agriculture? And when you think about it, like if you go really localized with it and get into like a regenerative 
farm or something like that, especially if it's nearby your house and you're, you're getting it from low transportation plus the regenerative aspect of it, it's, you know, then you're, then you're actually even going to the other side of the spectrum where you're, you, you see some of those processes where the, the carbon sequestration from, from that process not only makes up for the ruminants and cells, but the rest of the operations on that farm. And, you know, that's where I find it get, then, then it starts to get kind of political too. And the other thing I don't always understand, and I'm open to seeing some other information that I've maybe not been privy to, but, you know, we get into the, to the politics of it all. And people look at say like the green new deal, that's more or less just a scaffolding at this point. And uh, I think that scares a lot of people because they think that's a little more like hippie, like get rid of the meat, eat vegan. But every thing I've seen so far on a green new deal type of setup has had a component where they say that uh, we need to return to a local farming aspect and look into regenerative agriculture. So the messaging I get from that is if we would put something like that together as a policy, it's actually going to move us in a direction that is more focused on local foods and regenerative agriculture, regenerative meat processing versus kind of the, you know, the big Tysons and Cargills of the world. Yeah, let, let's hope so. Because one of the things that I, I very much enjoy is, you know, knowing my butcher or, or being able to, check out of the farm that's close by and, you know, see the animals roam. And then someone has a, a nice little garden, you know, like, I think that's wonderful. It's not a Luddite dream. I think it's just a question of, of understanding where your food comes from. Food has a central place in our culture, uh, in our politics, in our health. And yeah, we need it to be localized to some degree. I think people need to be in closer contact with it. And, you know, if, like you said, flying things in from all around the world, there's nothing wrong with doing that because we have the technology, but let's not kid ourselves about the cost that it has, especially when you're flying in something that's supposedly healthy, like some, you know, a terrible dreary piece of lettuce that has zero nutritional value for what, you know, that's an incredible waste of food. Let's, let's fly high quality meat in to areas who can't get it for people who need it that might be a better use of the transportation if you're going to fly food around. So yeah, I, I, I hope you're right about the, the Green New Deal. Um, that's, that's encouraging if it's handled properly. Yeah, I mean, it's still very nebulous what people are going to try to do. I mean, we're seeing uh, propositions for taxes bandied about in Australia, Germany, other countries. Or, you know, I, I see probably you know, it happening somewhere. I mean, probably in Europe, I mean, most likely to be my guess. I mean, I think that's where you're not going to see it in China. <laughs> Those guys are, you know, it's kind of, kind of interesting to see this. And, you know, we've got obviously in the news now, we've got this whole thing about, you know, the Amazon is got forest fires and it's kind of sort of, you know, we see that, I mean, you just kind of watch the propaganda that's kind of utilized from this stuff and, oh my gosh, the Amazon fire. Now we have to, everybody in the planet has to give up meat right this minute. And that's, that's the whole solution. And we, when you look deeper into it, you find out, yeah, but it's less fires than they normally have over a 30 year period. And it's up from last year, but it's down from five years ago. And most of the fires are just in agricultural land that was already deforested. And it's a tiny 0.2% of them are actually new forest. And, you know, you know, and it goes on and on and on, but I mean, the people are spinning this and we see this, this huge push from this, I mean, I think Nina Teichel's sort of documented that the, the industry that's behind this plant-based stuff has, you know, working capital of $5.7 trillion. And so they've got this massive amount of financial resource to get the message out there. And, you know, we've got, you know, the drug companies partnering with Google, giving them $800 million, sort of, are they manipulating the, the data that's out there? And so when you do it, when you do a Google search saying, are humans omnivores? PETA propaganda comes up first first thing. So, I mean, it's kind of a, a little bit disconcerting and somewhat frightening in my view that we're, we're sort of just kind of being herded in this direction. And I don't know what's going to, you know, you, you know if we're going to be able to stop that. And I, I think that uh, wow. if, we, if we just, you know, concede it, then, then, it's, then it's game over for sure. And uh, yeah, I think we should be we should be really careful about what we uh, um, sort of accept as the premise of the discussion. 
if we let people set the premise of discussion, like we were talking about earlier, that it's a trade-off between health and sustainability, we've lost the battle. Uh, first, first of all, there's a totally, this is asymmetric informational warfare. They have a budget that's ridiculous compared to any other sort of uh, alternative health movement, whether that's a, a quackery movement or an actual viable alternative health movement like low carb or you know, regenerative agriculture. I mean, the, the difference in budget is incredible. The, the sort of starting position is totally unfair. People have you know, hundreds of myths that they need to have deconstructed for them. And you know, it's, it only takes a second to say some nonsense, but it takes hours to deconstruct it. So again, we have this asymmetry, and I think probably one of the best things we can do is not <clears throat> to seed an inch on some very basic scientific principles. And I think for the, for the um, question of you know, sustainability, I think the uh, excellent starting point is the podcast you did with Rob Wolf. They can check out Peter Ballerstedt's work as well. Uh, this Frank, uh, uh, Frank Mitloner as well, that I think he was on your podcast, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, these guys are putting forward serious arguments. They're not hiding uh, behind uh, sort of um, uh, half-truths or stuff like that. And I think people need to hear those conversations. And then when it comes to nutrition, it's, you know, really try to, try to think for yourself. But that's going to be very difficult when Google makes search results um, uh, an unfair competition and simply a who can pay for it. Because that's what it is. I mean, look, I, I have a, a health and nutrition website. I understand now how the search engine optimi optimization game is played. People use millions of dollars to make sure their content is ranked. The quality of the content has absolutely nothing to do with it. And I think that's hard for people to accept. It, it took me a while to accept because I was genuinely naive to how it worked. And, you know, you, we have to sort of band together. And it's not a question about dietary counts. It's a question about freedom of information and a willingness to have an open and honest debate about really serious issues. And Google and the vegan plant-based propaganda are making this impossible. And it's affecting everyone. Yeah, I don't think it's, I think the difference is going to be, you know, I mean, to, to overcome that huge financial discrepancy, it's just going to have to take, it's just going to have to be up to people, you know, and lots of them and to be motivated and to sort of mobilize people to, to make the change because, you know, financial interests are going to drive the, the cheapest common denominator and the most profitable thing. And the most profitable thing is not going to be human health. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we're at a crossroads right now. We're, we're kind of like at the 1977 McGovern trial, mm -hmm. you know, hearings and in the, in, in the subsequent 1980 dietary guidelines that kind of came with that. And I think we're at a point where, you know, we can sit there and repeat history and watch things get worse. And the problem is it's slow to change. And that's the thing about the nice thing I find about nutrition, uh, as opposed to the environmental argument is, you know, I can, you know, I can literally look in the mirror. And, and say, hey, look, I'm healthier. I mean, it's not that hard to determine. You can, you can, you can pick through all the, you know, the, 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 I mean, there's so much conflicting information out there. And, and you can come to your own conclusion about your own health. I think most people can. I mean, it's pretty easy to say, hey, I was depressed and bedridden and now I'm out enjoying life. I mean, you, that's, that's a pretty obvious thing. But the problem with the environmental argument is very difficult for me to stand outside and look at the sky and say, yep it's definitely getting hotter or colder or it's definitely cow farts or it's, or, or no, it's, it's, you know, uh, this or that. And so it's, it, it's, I have to rely on whoever study I believe. And so it's frustrating. And so, uh, but the health argument should be one that's very easy to win. I mean, it's, and, and we're, we're, I think we're making some, some significant ground roads or inroads in that, in that place, because, you know, as we're seeing, you know, really literally within the low carb keto and, and now the carnivore community, you've got probably millions of people that are just saying, look, I'm, 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 I'm going to take it into my own hands because I'm, I'm doing better myself. And it's fun. It's fun to see that occur. And hopefully more people will continue to do that and get vocal. I think that's what ultimately mm -hmm. we have to do. We have to stand up and say, okay, look, the time has come where, you know, we, we see the writing on the wall. And if we don't do something and do something in a very, you know, active way, you know, because I know there's, there's people that tell me, oh, well, I'm, they, they can pry the ribeye out of my hands, well, you know, out of my cold, dead hands. I'm like, that sentiment is not going to, when you can't afford to eat the ribeye in the first place, when they tax it, 
so much that you can't afford to eat or I'm just going to go out and hunt. I mean, that, that attitude is the wrong attitude. You've got to get out there and, uh, you know, force policy. I mean, I think that's what's yeah. going to happen because if it's, if it's not you, it's going to be your children or your children's children who are, and it may be inevitable anyway, but I mean, I think to not fight for that to me is, 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 you know, not good. Yeah. And I hope that more and more people are aware of these sort of really inspiring anecdotes like Zach, uh, Zach's uh, record. And, you know, often people, you know, these, these sort of ideas have to enter popular culture. So, I mean, people should be impressed by what you've accomplished, Zach, and, and people should be impressed by what you've accomplished, Sean, on the rower. So I think, like, and I, you've mentioned this in the past, Sean, that it's important that we put interesting anecdotes out there because people really respond to that. And I think that's a, an excellent way of making some inroads, whether that's, you know, Joel Salatin's Polyface Farms or your 100 mile world record, Zach. I think these things have immense value because they're, they're easy to understand. They're an isolated example. Um, and the more and more that we can get these out in the public and then do the whole work of supporting them and explaining why it's possible and that this isn't just a one off and, you know, you know, others can can do sort of incredible things as well. I think that's where there's a lot of inroads to 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 make. Yeah, you know, it does seem like people people tend to gravitate towards seeing things happen in real life because that's what they can relate to. Like most people can't relate to a study in a laboratory. And I'm not saying that those are worthless. I think that's valuable information. And the big problem is usually just the way people interpret what the researchers intended to say when they when they did a study in the first place. But you know, when someone sees like Joel Salinson's farm actually go from like chalked off as wasteland essentially into being five times as productive as the neighboring farms. You know, that's real life in the field, like example of something happening. Uh, So I think you're right on with that. Yeah. Let's let's bring more anecdotes. I should go out and and, uh, have a record of my own then (laughs) contribute to the cause. (laughs) Were you, are you still doing the CrossFit stuff, Rafi? I know you were pretty, uh, pretty big into the CrossFit stuff for a while. You're still maintaining that while you're in Portugal? Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I have a CrossFit gym. That's, uh, just a couple of minutes from my house. And, and, uh, when was it in, uh, um, sorry, uh, just a month ago, I was actually at the CrossFit games in Madison, Wisconsin. I was invited by a uh, CrossFit headquarters to attend the CrossFit health conference and be part of the guests there, you know, to discuss all of these really important, aspects of the industry, uh, the influence of uh, big food and big farmer on, on the health claims that are being made. And I was very lucky. I got to attend the CrossFit Games and meet some really, really interesting people there. And yeah, it just renewed my, uh, my energy to keep putting in the effort to, to do a few wads a, a couple of times a week and, and, and keep it up in the gym. Uh, it, it's really inspiring to see what people are able to do, the sort of dedication they have. And it's, it's a good reminder, I think, for, for ourselves that we should keep putting in the work, even though it's not our job. Uh, I, I know that the mental impact it has on me, even more than the physical impact, is, it's incredible. It's, it's really like like a drug when you put in the work and you get that effort after 10, 12, 15 minutes of of intense exercise. It's, it's, I think it's probably one of the most undervalued aspects of mental health. And and that's what I've come to appreciate about it even more than, you know, it's, it's nice to look good naked and that sort of stuff. Uh, You know, the, the mental aspects is really, really good for me, I think. Yeah, I agree. Well, well, Rafi, we've got another podcast we've got to get on in just a minute. So can you tell folks, uh, and and once again, thank you so much for being on. This will be valuable information for our listeners. Can you tell people where to get a hold of you, what you're up to, how to find your app, uh, and so on and so forth? Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. It was was a lot of fun. Um, Yeah, so people can find me um, if they want to see the articles that we write at uh, on the Nutrita website. It's uh, nutrita.app. N-U-T-R-I-T-A dot A-double-P. We have the apps coming out in September. So we've got Nutrita Pro, which you can access from the web browser. That'll be a subscription app. And then we've got the free uh, Nutrita Lite. That's a mobile app on iOS and Android. It's also coming out in September. And then if they want to follow me on tw- on Twitter, I'm at Raphael S7, with, uh, spelled with a P-H. And then on Instagram, I think I'm Raphael711, if I'm not mistaken. I always forget my Instagram handle. (laughs) 
So if they want a lot of pictures of my current carnivore diet that I've been doing for about eight months now, uh, I didn't expect to do it for long, actually, to be perfectly honest. I just tried it out before going to the carnivore conference. And then it, I just really enjoyed it. So I just kept doing it. And I'm still doing it. So I'll probably keep doing it for, for a while. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a trap, man. I got to tell you, you know, yeah. I mean, and it's kind of fun because I know, you, you know, even a couple of years ago, you were kind of dabbling with, with mostly meat and stuff like that. But I mean, I think most people find that they just feel better on it. And, you know, at some point, you know, even long term, they most people still gravitate to 90 percent 80 percent meat they, they just feel they realize how valuable that is in their diet and then you know if, if you're having a couple you know a couple of blueberries and a, and, a, and a slice of orange here and there hey man that's good more power to yeah. you but i mean i think i think when we realize that this is really you know i like to call it just human food i mean this is what we evolve why we evolve what we evolve to do and it, it's just so incredibly valuable and and, and you know you find how fortunate we really are to be able to eat like this only because of modern you know modern agricultural practices which many people abhor but at the same time it's allowed us to to sort of and, and not all of it's bad i mean obviously there's a regenerative movement but i mean I, we went for about twenty thousand years or fifteen thousand years where you know we didn't eat much meat because it was you know a, a it, livestock was valuable for its work, you know, beasts of burden, they're plowing the field so you could grow your, you know, grow your wheat or, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever part of the world you're in. And so you didn't eat the cows until they were ready to keel over and then you finally ate them. But, uh, you know, now we have a much, uh, you know, we're, in a, we're, we're, we're back to where we were when we were hunting mammoths, basically, you know, where we had <laughs> that, uh, we had that unlimited Easy supply access. of good food. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just uh, once again, thanks for having me on. It's I, I love what you guys are doing with the podcast. Uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of podcasts out there sort of recycle the same guests again and again. You you guys have had a really interesting lineup, um, so I, I always look forward to to the next uh, guest to come on your show. And and thanks for tackling the hard issues head on with a lot of uh, an open mind, but also a, a firm fist when it comes to some some aspects that we really can't compromise on, like uh, to fight the propaganda. So more power to you guys. And yeah, I look forward to, to more episodes. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Rafi. We're, we'll be happy to add you to the list of guests. So uh, we'll put the links to those uh, social media and websites in the show notes. Thank you, awesome. And congrats again, Zach. That was an <laughs> incredible effort, really. <laughs> Take care. Take hey folks, Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing. And due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.